Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. In succession, O King, the great sage Narada instructed Srimad Bhagavatam unto the unlimitedly powerful Vyasadeva, who meditated in devotional service upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Absolute Truth, on the bank of the river Saraswati. Repeat. In succession, O King, o King, the great sage Narada, the great sage Narada instructed Srimad Bhagavatam unto the unlimitedly powerful Vyasadi, who meditated in devotional service upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Absolute Truth, on the bank of the river Saraswati. Purport. In the fifth chapter of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Narada instructed the great sage Vyasadeva as follows. Ato maha bhagabhavan namo vidrik shuchi shava satirato vrita brata urukramasya kila bhanda vuktaye samadina nusmara tadvicheshtitam O greatly fortunate, pious philosopher, your name and fame are universal and you are fixed in the absolute truth with spotless character and infallible vision. I ask you to meditate upon the activities of the Personality of Godhead, whose activities are unparalleled. Just a note, because it's a long purport, so I'll put a little bit at a time. So we see here the emphasis on the succession, first word, in succession that uh, our whole philosophy, our whole uh, life is based on this principle of Guru Parampara or disciplic succession. As we know yesterday, uh, Brahma was speaking to his son Narada. And now, as it's the first word in succession, Narada will now continue to the next link uh, in succession, Vyasadeva. And it's very interesting that even though his Vyasadeva is coming after him, Narada Muni is uh, very respectful. He knows, he knows, he's conscious of who Vyasadeva is. He's fully aware Vyasadeva is an incarnation of Krishna. He's fully aware of his, uh, his unlimited, he calls him unlimitedly powerful. Uh, and he, uh, he, especially in this first quarter from the first canto, he's, he's going to, he's instructing him as his disciple, but at the same time, He's recognizing uh, his position. It's not that uh, Narada Muni is... Uh, he's taking the position of spiritual master, of guru, but at the same time, uh, he's fully aware of Vyasadeva's position and he offers all respect to him. And at the same time, he's also, uh, as actual spiritual master, recognizes that he's a servant, that he's eternally a servant. And he's performing the service in disciplic succession to pass on the message as received originally from Govinda, Krishna, to Brahma. Narada received it from Brahma, and now Narada is passing it to Vyasadeva. And we have so many examples, Krishna himself, Lord Chaitanya himself, that even though they're the Supreme Personality of God, to give the example for uh, history, for everyone to follow, uh, they accept the spiritual master, even though they obviously they know everything. They're uh, <clears throat> they are the absolute truth. Krishna is the absolute truth, but still, he accepts uh, his spiritual master in disciplic succession and authorized uh, sampradaya. And here, Narada Muni is giving that same example. That, uh, even though, and Vyasadeva is giving that same example. That even though he is an incarnation of Krishna. Uh, Narada Muni is his devotee, still the succession is going on in that way. But he's, he is instructing Vyasadeva, who's temporarily, it seems as if he's temporarily in anxiety and difficulty. And now Narada Muni is instructing him to meditate, instructing him to meditate on the pastimes of Krishna. So he's, he's not, or he says, I ask you to meditate upon the activities of the personality of God. And uh, this is, will be the best thing for you. Uh, the spiritual master, he, he understands the, the position of the disciple. And uh, 
the situation of the disciples, and he gives an instruction what is most favorable for his advancement in spiritual life. So we'll continue. So in the disciplic succession of Brahma Sampradaya, the practice of yoga meditation is not neglected. Um, I think this Prabhupada is writing here, this is the second canto, so he's already come to the West as far as I know. He already come to the West? Yeah, he already come to the West. So he, fa he found that in the West, meditation was very popular. Meditation was uh, quite popular. There was, of course, and it's still going on, transcendental meditation. Prabhupada had so much to say about transcendental meditation. So he's giving a little note here. Just see, we're not, or it's not that we're neglecting meditation, but real meditation, the actual meditation. Because Prabhupada, he would, is very uh, much against this so-called transcendental meditation where you pay, well, at that time it was only $35. Now it's $3,500 probably. Much more expensive. But at that time, at even at that time, $35 was some lot of money. And so Prabhupada, just see the $35 and you get the mantra and then you become God. So what, uh, in six months you become God. Prabhupada he would always repeatedly mention this, this bogus meditation, this uh, false kind of meditation, that they're taking it to be meditation, or they're meditating on some void. They think they can meditate on some void or uh, impersonal conception, Brahman, effulgence, and somehow that they can be, meditate and become God. Robert says in the introduction to the Krishna book, says it's not, Krishna is not that kind of God that by his made in a mystic factory, <laughs> that is, by, by meditation he became God. Krishna just from uh, his childhood, even at three months old, he killed this great powerful demon, Putana, uh, uh, when he was still sucking his mother's breast as a small baby. So it's not that he meditated and became God, as the uh, bogus meditators are proposing. <clears throat> but real meditation is to meditate upon Krishna. Real yoga meditation is to meditate upon Krishna, his form, his pastimes. This is what verse is about. This is the instruction of Narada Muni to Vyasadeva. To not accept, uh, to understand what you're supposed to meditate on. I remember before coming to Krishna consciousness, I'm reading some books about meditation, and it was all candle, light, uh, om, sometimes om, but it was basically meditating on. Uh, impersonal, some impersonal idea. I remember it was so. Klesho dikataraste shama vyakta shakta chaitasam. Very difficult. It was, it was, you know, look at a candle and then the mind immediately is going to, to the forms. Immediately the mind will go to some form, some remembrance of our activities, uh, our bodily form, the form of someone else. And generally, you meditate on sense gratification, on the form, the exchange of forms for sense gratification. As much as you're trying to fix your mind on, but how can you, you can fix the mind on nothing? It's uh, practically impossible. And even if you're able to, for some time, with great, great endeavor, then you'll fall down afterwards. It's guaranteed because there's no ananda, there's no pleasure, there's no happiness. Uh, <clears throat> And still, even to get there, very, very long, and difficult, arduous process that none of us are, or even close to capable, will ever be close to capable to, to executing. So Prabhupada saw that in the West, many of these so-called yogis, they had come to exploit the, the innocence of the West, Westerners, uh, by offering a cheap version of uh, so-called meditation. Because most of the people, they like meditation because they think, I'll become free of anxiety. I'll become free of the stress and anxiety of my sense gratification life. But Prabhupada said they practice meditation in a big city, and uh, then when the session is over, they go out and immediately smoking, drinking, eating uh, all nonsense things. So their meditation is, is useless. The real meditation up for the, uh, as described in Bhagavad Gita, is performed in such a forest. Uh, the forest in a, in a secluded place, completely celibate, free from all sense gratification. Uh, great austerity. Things that I mean, it's difficult for us to stay here for a few days. It's just it's cold and 
raining, and and uh, I'm sure I mean, we have it easier. We're in a nice room up there, but <laughs> I'm sure it's more. It's still it's cold, but uh, I'm sure it's quite austere just to be in this tent. But imagine to stay for months and years with nothing, no tent, no tent is no tents allowed, no no uh, sleeping bags allowed, just sitting and meditating on nothing, or at best some impersonal idea. It's practically, it's, it's out of our league, it's out of our even dream to do such a thing. <coughs> so, what is the actual process? Prabhupada will now describe what is the actual process of meditation, which is uh, practical also for us. But because the devotees are uh, bhakti yogis, they do not undertake the trouble to meditate upon the impersonal Brahman, as indicated here. They meditate on Brahma Paramam, or the Supreme Brahman. Brahman realization begins from the impersonal effulgence, but by further progress of such meditation, manifestation of the Supreme Soul, Paramatma realization takes place, and progressing further realization of the Supreme Personality of God it is fixed. Sri Narada Muni, as the spiritual master of Vyasadeva, knew very well the position of Vyasadeva, and thus he certified the qualities of Srila Vyasadeva as fixed in the absolute truth with great vow, etc. Narda advised meditation upon the transcendental activities of the Lord. The impersonal Brahman has no activities, but the personality of God had as many activities, and all such activities are transcendental without any tinge of material qualities. If the activities of the Supreme Brahman were material activities, then Narda would not have advised Vyasadeva to meditate upon them. So it's not that Prabhupada is, is describing that we should first perform Brahman realization and then come to the stage of Paramatma and then meditate on Krishna. But Prabhupada says, I was listening to one tape the other day, Prabhupada said it's a very simple process. He was in Los Angeles and he was looking at this Rukmini Dwarkadish, because his Vyasa sign is, is, at least it was, uh, until they changed it. He was right in, in the end of the temple, like in Maipa, right in front, looking straight ahead at, at the deities uh, in the first original temple room that he liked very much and he didn't want them to move over. You mean the same one that is there now? No. They were where the, where the Dal exhibit is now. That was the original temple room. That's where they made the three altars. And they had the original temple room and Prophet's quarters. He came right down out of the back door behind there and came right into the temple room. And the Vyasasan was at the end of the temple room against the wall. And then they looked right at uh, the deities. <coughs> the men were on one side and the ladies were on the other side, all in a line like that, standing sideways. But he the deities there. Joined, the that. Was here that they shifted. He was here, but he didn't. He didn't. They, he was away from. He was in India, uh-huh. and they 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 liked. They did it anyway. Because when I'll, if you want, I can tell a little story. Oh, it's interesting. <laughs> He, uh, the point is that he's telling them that, that it's very simple to meditate on Krishna. You just look at Krishna, the deity, the murti, and, uh, and you meditate, you see his smiling face, you see his lotus feet, and you see his form, and you, med- and you look at that form and you think of that form. It's not a complicated process, it's not a difficult process. Krishna is standing before us, and you simply you look at him, and you meditate on him, on his form. Uh, <coughs> You read the Krishna book and you meditate on his activities. That's simple for the simple, very simple process. What happened was, in the temple room, is that the other room, was the present temple room, was a church. It was a church room that had seats in it. It was all full of seats. And it had a, had a podium, like an altar and a podium. And it had a huge organ, one of those big church organs with those big tubes really high. The prophet even sat down and he played on the organ. And he told the devotees to have Sunday feast and to keep the seats and have the guests sit in the seats. And, and the devotees should stand at the podium, the regular podium, standing up, and give the lecture so the guests would feel comfortable and in a uh, uh, nice situation to listen to the lecture for the Sunday, at the Sunday feast. And so, but they. <laughs> They changed it. They, they decided, this is my, these seats, you know, and they, they took all the seats out and uh, changed everything. 
that actually brought the light that the way it was arranged in the Tabata Lensa. No, then they go. Then you go to the Arctic in the Tabata. But to sit down for the cla- the oh, lecture, to the, sit down for the lecture for the public. He had a they, separate lecture. Room. Yeah, it was it was it was that was what now was the temple and that was a lecture hall, and he liked that very much. And uh, he liked he wanted liked the organ also. <coughs> you could ask him either like Donald or Marsh. He was there. Remember they they first moved in the temple and it was like that. And the ladies stu- and it, and it was. <clears throat> Practically, the the Vyasa was here, the altar was here, and the men were on one side, and the ladies were on the other side, facing each other. And then standing with the left side towards the altar, right side towards the altar, or vice versa, if you're standing on the other side. So they had their back in order to the deities, altar Brahma. Yeah, that was it. Anyway, that's another story. And, uh, <clears throat> but here the, uh, we're speaking about meditation. So Prabhupada says, if meditation is not neglected, we perform meditation. Uh, but our meditation is upon the transcendental form of Krishna and the transcendental activities. I wanted to read, uh, since we're in the line of the Krishna book, <laughs> to read something from the Krishna book about this kind of meditation and the desire of the residents of Vrindavan who are always meditating. They're seeing Krishna and they're always, in, uh, when Krishna is absent, they're always meditating on his activities. It's not that we are trying to artificially um, imagine that we are engaged in Krishna's activities. This is also a trick, a dangerous trick, that we try to imagine ourselves, that I am a gopi or I'm a a coward boy, and I'm there, and we try to fantasize that I'm there with Krishna or embracing Krishna or something like that. That's not not our process of meditation. Prabhupada did just speak in different places in the Krishna book that was were meant to read the pastimes of Krishna and remember them, remember the pastimes, but not falsely imagining that I'm there, I'm, take, I'm taking part. And it's explained that by chanting Hare Krishna mantra and becoming free from offenses, then then will be revealed by the spiritual master through the chanting of the holy name. The Bhakti Chumash told me that. He asked Prabhupada, how will it be revealed by relationship. If you're not here anymore, how will we, we reveal the problem? So through the chanting of the Holy Name, uh, everything will be revealed by the spiritual master in due course of time as you uh, become qualified, become free of all offenses in chanting the Holy Name. Then you'll be gradually revealed our position as servant uh, and then gradually our relation, eternal relationship with Krishna. So this, this meditation doesn't mean artificially uh, meditating, but it means to remember the pastimes, and, and also every morning as we see the form of the Lord in the deity form, because remember that Archamurti is non different is Krishna. Prabhupada once said that if you if you see if you think that he's stone, he'll remain stone for, for you forever. If you're thinking he's stone, but he's Krishna, and if you really understand that he's Krishna, then he'll reciprocate with you, he'll reveal himself to you. So the process is, he also explains in the Nectar of Devotion that as uh, to realize this, you should worship the deities Radha and Krishna, he specifically mentions Radha, by worshiping Radha and Krishna, then one will, uh, the deities, by performing puja and worship of the deity regularly, then uh, will develop an attraction or attachment for Krishna. So Prabhupada, he gave great emphasis, he gave great emphasis, as we know, for in the Kali Yuga, uh, the Yuga Dharma is chanting of the Holy Name and the process for liberation, process for purification is chanting of the Holy Name. But Prabhupada also established uh, this process of archer worship and also the process of hearing the pastimes and activities of Krishna. He gave, he gave such a, we discussed yesterday, he gave great energy to reading the, writing the Krishna book and then distributing the Krishna book. Uh, to describe, he wanted very much to, he, sa- he said that, we read that yesterday, that how I may not be able to finish the whole Srimad Bhagavatam, so therefore I'm giving these pastimes of Krishna for the pleasure of, of all the devotees in case I'm not able to finish it. Because he wanted devotees to hear and develop an attraction for Krishna, but not artificially, not artificially jumping up 
trying to push ourselves into the pastimes of Krishna, but by quite submissively, submissive oral reception, uh, submissively hearing regularly these pastimes. And <coughs> Prabhupada also give great energy and time to developing and establishing uh, deity worship, worship of the form of the Lord, uh, so that we could engage our body, our mind, our activities, um, as I would also quote many times Ambarish Maharaj, how he would engage, engaging, even though he was a great emperor and king, he, I would say they didn't have to go, but he was going every day to the temple, uh, bowing down, offering service to the, to the deity in the temple. And this is the example Prophet himself was performing. They asked Prophet's son, some devotees asked Prophet's son, what was he doing in the household life? And he said that he was always very busy in, in puja. He was quite busy in puja. He was even making clothes for his deities uh, <coughs> and worshipping them every day. So this is an important aspect. This is our meditation. Our meditation is not uh, uh, abstract or impersonal uh, idea, but it's very direct. We meditate on the form of Shishi Gornitai, Shishi Radhan, Krishna, Krishna Balaram. Uh, and it's not it's not a mystical or difficult process. You look at them with your eyes, you engage your eyes in seeing them uh, <coughs> and, and that image because otherwise we were looking at so many forms. I'm looking at uh, Mahaprabhu's face. When I close my eyes I can see Mahaprabhu's face. Mahaprabhu Prabhu's face. I can see his face by, just, by closing my eyes because I've looked at that impression has gone into my mind and uh, <coughs> will purify me. For sure. So if I look at Shishi Gornitai's form and try to fix my eyes on them, then I close my eyes and then I, and I can see their form. And that is that is our meditation. That's our uh, process of meditation. Chanting the holy name, Hare Krishna, and looking and seeing the transcendental form of the Lord. So I want to read this. Uh, this is from the chap chapter 35, the Gopi's feelings of separation. This is the end, end of the chapter. <clears throat> Such descriptions of Krishna's transcendental pastimes and activities were remembered by the Gopis during his absence from Vrindavan. They give us some idea of how attractive Krishna is, not only to human beings, but to all animate and inanimate objects. In Vrindavan, the trees, the plants, the water, animals like the deer and cows, everybody and everything is attracted to Krishna. That is the perfect description of Krishna's attraction. The example of the gopis is very instructive to persons who are trying to be absorbed in Krishna consciousness. We're, we're meant, according to this, we're meant to take this example. Uh, this is very instructive because we're trying to become absorbed in Krishna consciousness. That's our goal of our all of our activities, is to try to become absorbed in Krishna consciousness. So here are the examples being given by the gopis. One can very easily associate with Krishna simply by remembering his transcendental pastimes. Everyone has a tendency to love someone. That Krishna should be the object of love is the central point of Krishna consciousness. That Krishna should be the object of love is the central point of Krishna consciousness. By constantly chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and remembering the transcendental pastimes of Krishna, one can be fully in Krishna consciousness and thus make his life sublime and fruitful. So this is the process. Then the next is one of the Krishna book uh, seminars about all these chapters regarding the Rasalila and the Gopis. There's at the, the last paragraph of each chapter is quite interesting. The Prabhupada gives a very interesting aspect of the philosophy uh, at, at the la right at the end of each of these chapters. So I compiled them all and, and they're all, they all kind of fit together. Very interesting. This one is in the 47th chapter. Yeah. Delivery of the message of Krishna to the Gopis. 
And this is uh, right at the end also. These are the prayers of the residents of Vrindavan. Uddhav is just about to leave Vrindavan after staying a few months there, as he was requested by Krishna to go and give some solace to the residents of Vrindavan. And he's just about to leave. He's decided now it's time to go back to my service to Krishna in uh, Mathura. And he's asking permission of the residents of Vrindavan to, to leave. After living in Vrindavan for some time, Uddhava desired to go back to Krishna, and he begged permission to leave from Nanda Maharaj in Yashoda. He had a farewell meeting with the gopis, and taking permission from them also, he mounted his chair to start for Mathura. When Uddhava was about to leave, all the inhabitants of Vrindavan, headed by Maharaj Nanda and Yashoda, came to bid him goodbye and presented him with various kinds of valuable goods secured in Vrindavan. They expressed their feelings with tears in their eyes due to intense attachment for Krishna. All of them desired a benediction from Uddhav. So this is what, this is what is the benediction that the residents of Vrindavan requested from Uddhav? They desired to always remember the glorious activities of Krishna and wanted their minds to be always fixed upon his lotus feet, their words to be always engaged in glorifying him, and their bodies to be always engaged in bowing down as they constantly remembered him. This, this, this is a point. This prayer of the inhabitants of Vrindavan is the super excellent type of self-realization. The method is very simple, to fix the mind always on the lotus feet of Krishna. That means also looking at the lotus feet, right, and the deity form, the lotus feet of God and Krishna. To talk always of Krishna without passing on to any other subject matter, and to engage the body in Krishna's service constantly. Especially in this human form of life, one should engage his life, resources, words, and intelligence for the service of the Lord. Only such activities can elevate a human being to the highest level of perfection. This is the verdict of all authorities. Then it continues, the inhabitants of Vrindavan said, by the will of the supreme authority and according to the results of our own work, we may take our birth anywhere. It doesn't matter where we are born. You can see there's the residents of Vrindavan. who's not there. They're the most liberated personalities that, that, that exist. And they're, but they're thick. I may take birth again. No, it doesn't matter. Mama Janmani, Janmani, Shwari Bhavata, Bhakti Rahai, Tukhi Twain. They're the same mood of Lord Chaitanya. Uh, birth after birth. It doesn't matter where we are born, but our only prayer is that we may simply be engaged in Krishna consciousness. A pure devotee of Lord Krishna never desires to be promoted to the heavenly planets or even to Vaikuntha or Goloka Vrindavan because he has no desire for his own personal satisfaction. They're not approaching for their uh, Udev to ask a prayer for some personal satisfaction. They simply want to be absorbed in devotional service, remembering Krishna, remembering his pastimes. Every, every place they visit, they go in Vrindavan, they, they stop because every every inch of Vrindavan, it reminds them of some pastime that Krishna performed in that place. That's why we go to visit the holy places of Vrindavan, Mayapur, so that we absorb our mind, we can absorb our mind and also our vision in seeing the place where Krishna performed his pastimes, to give us impetus to remember Krishna's pastimes. A pure devotee regards heaven and hell to be on an equal level. Without Krishna, heaven is hell, and with Krishna, hell is heaven. When Uddhava had been sufficiently honored and worshipped by the pure devotees of Vrindavan, he returned to Matra and to his master Krishna. Uh, after offering respects by bowing down before Lord Krishna Balaram, he described the wonderful devotional life of the inhabitants of Vrindavan. So this, <coughs> this is the example that we're meant to take. Uh, we always stay at a distance and offer our respects to Gopi Bharata Parakamalera Das 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 Anu Das that we want for Chaitanya want to be the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant of the uh, servant of the Gopis. Uh, <coughs> but at the same time Prabhupada is giving reference here as an example by their example that it, it's actually the super excellent type of self-realization that a very simple process simply to fix our mind on 
uh, the activities of Krishna. And Prabhupada wrote this book just so that we have the material to fix our mind on. That's all. Because we have enough. We can't say that there's nothing to think about. <laughs> we don't have enough material. Prabhupada gave more material than, than any acharya in the past, any saint, or any person ever in history has, has ever given to give us an opportunity to remember Krishna. So read the last part of the purport. Right? Quickly, because today is the holy disappearance day of Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada and Srila Gauridas Pandit. And uh, so we'll just conclude here and then uh, Maharaj will speak something about his uh, great personalities. I'll try to speak something else. So in the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, when Arjuna realized the factual position of Lord Krishna, he addressed Lord Krishna in the following words. Arjuna summarized the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita by his realization of Lord Sri Krishna, and thus said, My dear personality of Godhead, you are the supreme absolute truth, the original person in the eternal form of bliss and knowledge. And this is confirmed by Narada, Asita, Devala, and Vyasadeva. And above all, your personal self has also confirmed it. Bhagavad Gita 10, verses 12 through 13, 12 and 13. When Vyasadeva fixed his mind in meditation, he did it in Bhakti Yoga, trance, and actually saw the Supreme Person with Maya, the illusory energy, in contraposition. As we have discussed before, the Lord's Maya, or illusion, is also a representation, uh, because Maya has no existence without the Lord. Mama Maya, Krishna says this very clearly, this is my Maya, this is my energy. Darkness is not independent of light. Without light, no one can experience the contraposition of darkness. However, this maya, or illusion, cannot overcome the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but stands apart from him, apashrayam. Therefore, perfection of meditation is realization of the Personality of Godhead, along with his transcendental activities. Meditation on the impersonal Brahman is a troublesome business for the meditator, as confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 12.5, Klesho Dikataras Desham Avyakta Sattva Chaitasa. Yeah. You want to speak something about Rupa Goswami first? Okay. I, I just got to the Okay. 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 Could, you, could you set this up? Shri Chaitanya Manavis, Manavis, Tapitam Yeda Bhutale, Svayam Rupa Kadamayam, Dadati Svapadam Tikam. So Srila Prabhupada also, we've been speaking about the Krishna, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God, and the Krishna book. But right at the same time, even, even I think a little before, Srila Prabhupada produced the Nectar of Devotion, which he says is a summary study of the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu is written by Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. And Prabhupada explains right in the beginning introduction of the uh, Nectar of Devotion, that we are followers in the footsteps of Sri Rupa Goswami, and therefore we are to be called Rupa Nuga, following in the footsteps of Sri Rupa Goswami. So for us, uh, very, very important, uh, extremely important, to understand who is Sri Rupa Goswami, uh, what are his pastimes, what are his teachings, the Sri Chaitanya Chaitamrita, uh, there's a whole chapter of teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to Sri Rupa Goswami, Shilupa Goswami is the, uh, and Sanatana Goswami, as we know, they are brothers. Uh, they were the uh, close followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, two of the six Goswamis, uh, the famous six Goswamis, three of whom were in the same, from the same family. Three out of the six, Shilupa Goswami, Shila Sanatana Goswami, and Shila Jiva Goswami, from the same family. And uh, Sri Rupa Goswami in particular is asked by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to explain uh, <coughs> the Rasa Tattva, the Bhakti, the nature of Bhakti. Uh, 
And so, uh, most important book was the Bhakti Rasamita Sindhu, which Srila Prabhupada gave us in uh, such a wonderful way, such an easy, easily understandable way of, as the Nectar of Devotion. And Prabhupada says right in the beginning of Nectar of Devotion that this is meant for my followers. This book is meant for my followers to be, develop a, a strong foundation in Krishna consciousness. And Sri Rupa Goswami gives the full science of Bhakti Yoga from A to Z, the beginning to the end, from the, high, from the beginning level to the highest level. Even though we may not understand very much, that probably the first time you read Nectar Devotion, you won't understand, especially the, the second two-thirds, uh, you may not understand very much. But Prabhupada said that we should go on reading it again and again. And as you become purified, as you engage in devotional service year after year, then you'll gradually understand more and more. And I can recommend also that if you, one devotee, Dhanadar Swami, he wrote a very nice introduction and study guide to the nectar devotion, waves of devotion, it's called. And I found that to be extremely helpful. I read them side by side, and uh, it really opened up a lot of things and understanding of the nectar devotion. So our relationship with Srila Rupa Goswami in Pacific succession is especially by Srila Prabhupada's mercy through this book, Nectar Devotion, to understand his teachings, uh, what he uh, taught and, and as uh, <coughs> pure devotional service, specifically bringing us to the point of uh, Raghunuga Bhakti or, or pure devotion, spontaneous devotion, uh, which he speaks about quite a bit in Bhakti Rasa Nitasindu. But Prabhupada is very, that's why we have to read Nectar Devotion and not try to jump and find it through some other method. Prabhupada is giving the full authorized method of following uh, Srila Rupa Goswami uh, and his teachings exactly explained in the, in the right process. The one cannot artificially uh, jump up to uh, thinking that he's on a spontaneous level. But uh, Prabhupada says right in the Nectar Devotion that one, one cannot relish the pastimes of Radha and Krishna and the gopis unless he's on a liberated platform, unless he's already he's free from all material anarthas, he's all beyond the anartha liberty platform. So if one is honest with himself, he knows he's not, may not be beyond all of material attractions and material desires. So he has to follow the processes given by Srila Rupa Goswami in the step-by-step -step process of purification. Adoshrada, uh, <clears throat> that by developing faith and the association with devotees, uh, and then taking up the process of bhakti yoga, sadhana bhakti. Uh, <clears throat> this is how Srila Rupa Goswami has taught us. So we, most of us, we're on that platform, Anartha Nivriti, we're trying to become purified by following. We've taken shelter with the spiritual master. We're following his instructions, following his uh, directions. And we'll gradually make progress and become freed from the Anarthas or material attractions. And thus, but we should understand that our, our uh, relationship with Sri Rupa Goswami is very important, but it comes through the Guru Parampara, Sri Prabhupada. Sometimes people say that uh, this is Prabhu. I always forget. I forget your name. Kripa Pala. Kripa Pala. We've been talking, worshiping the Shalagram Shiva together in my room, and uh, some people they go to visit other acharyas, other mats, and other things, and then they say. Somehow they said they reveal that Rupa Goswami, how important he is, how we're followers of Rupa Goswami. Prabhupada already revealed that. Prabhupada already said that. All those things that some other people like, may be saying, they're already there in Prabhupada's books. It's already uh, explained uh, very much in detail in Nectar Devotion. So we shouldn't think that we'll find something new or some more elevated or newer idea somewhere else. But if we read in Nectar Devotion with great attention, and uh, concentration, and that, like I said, that other book helps a lot. You'll be able to understand uh, fully the glories of Srila Rupa Goswami. Srila Rupa Goswami, as we know, is an associate and servant uh, in the spiritual world of Srimati Radharani. 
and, uh, in that line, but he also gives in the Nectar Devotion all the different aspects, all the different rasas with Krishna, all of the different relationships with Krishna, and uh, all of the different aspects of Krishna's personality, uh, and his qualities, and So we should really follow Srila Rupa Goswami under Srila Prabhupada's direction. Uh, because we are meant to follow Srila Rupa Goswami. Srila Prabhupada told us that. He tells us it very clearly in the devotion. But uh, in a proper way. Not artificially, as we mentioned before, not artificially trying to become the same as Srila Rupa Goswami. Or, uh, but to follow in his footsteps under Prabhupada's direction. Prabhupada's direction for us means the nectar of devotion. How to follow Shri Prabhupada. All the teachings are there. All of the, uh, I was mentioning Marasha, some people, with some other mats, you can go and they say, like some new revelation that we're supposed to follow Rupa Goswami. And he has, that's the real secret message and secret line we're supposed to follow. But I said that, like it's some new higher revelation. But Prabhupada, he already said that. He already said all of these things. He already gave all this information in the nectar of devotion. Just that we maybe didn't read it very carefully or not uh, uh, take it seriously or not. But he's, he's giving us that path to follow. And Sri Rupa Goswami's teachings are there in the in nectar of devotion and then Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita to go more deeply into how to approach Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how to approach a uh, relationship with Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. But we should follow it in a proper step-by-step process, not in uh, imitation process. And that's what Prabhupada, and that, then we'll be safe. Then we'll, uh, we'll not become the artificial Rupa Goswami. Srila Prabhupada was very much against, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was very much against this so-called uh, Rupa Goswami, that they go to Radha Kund, or they go to Vindavan and they're dressing like Babaji, but then they're smoking and they're having illicit connection with women and they're, and they're trying to pass as, as some on the level of Rupa Goswami. But real Rupa Goswami means following uh, Sarana Bhakti uh, <coughs> as, it, as it, it's given by Sri Prabhupada. And, and gradually we'll make progress. We'll, we'll, we'll progress uh, over beyond the platform of the North and Liberty if we, we faithfully, seriously, and steadily follow the process with enthusiasm, uh, with great enthusiasm. We can come to that platform one day, but uh, not by imitating or artificially trying to become Rupa Goswami. But by offering all respects and, and following his teachings as given by Srila Prabhupada. So that's what I didn't tell the story of his life and how he came to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That was it just came to my mind about because it was in line with just some things we're saying in the class about the nectar of devotion. As we know, Sri Rupa and Sanatana Goswami, I had the fortune to go to Ramakali where they were living. Prabhupada would always emphasize so much how they were so uh, in such high positions. They were prime minister and head minister, uh, treasury minister, I think, uh, in, in the government of Bengal. They were so uh, wealthy. Rupa Goswami has explained that he, when he took shelter Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he brought, he had to give away boatloads, a whole boat full of gold. I can't imagine what he said, he said, he said gold, it's, imagine a whole boat full of gold and wealth and riches. And Prabhupada was always giving emphasis how they, they gave that all up and took shelter of the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and went under his order, they went to Vrindavan. Uh, and under his order, uh, after he spoke to them, uh, the essential message of the Vedic, Vedic knowledge and he gave them that service to write books to expand on as we were speaking about yesterday that uh, there were f- four nutshell verses of Bhagavatam but there's also can be up to four billion verses of Srimad Bhagavatam how the end is how the Acharyas they expand on that so Sri Rupa Goswami Sanatana Goswami they received instruction from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and then they 
wrote the books expanding on that um, message of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yeah. Um, Gauriya Vaishnavas are known as Rupa Novas, not Chaitanya Novas. Why is that? Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Jaina Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Sopadanti. Come, we offer our respects to Rupa Goswami who has revealed the inner heart's desire of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, this is described in Chaitanya Charitamrita how um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's inner heart's desire. In other words, his being Krishna in the mode of Radharani was known to Sri Damodar Goswami, but he didn't tell anyone else. But Rupa Goswami also perceived that. And on the order of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he wrote so many books. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu didn't write books, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed, especially Rupa and Sanatana, and they wrote many books. Uh, and the, the other of, of the six Goswamis and subsequent generations of Vaishnavas, they wrote many books, of which Rupa Goswami is especially trying to was talking about this Bhaktira Samrita Sindhu, which is the handbook for all devotees. It defines what is the line of devotion given by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, summarizes its super excellence, it tells us what it is in all aspects and how to enter into it. So in this way he's the, 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 the father of devotional service and all other devotees follow on after this. I just want to read one, actually two paragraphs from, from my uh, upcoming book on Bhaktisthan Saswat Thakur. Um, Srila Rupa Goswami was excellent. This is in relationship to the Babaji's of Vrindavan and Navadip who would who presume themselves to be followers of Rupa Goswami by accepting a, his same kind of dress and as Chai Prabhu was also uh, referring to, to, to that um, they would have this uh, Siddha Panali of imagining oneself to be a gopi. Um, so, um, what is it? These these words, Ragatnika Bhakti, Raganoga Bhakti, um, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu leads us to the path of Raganoga Bhakti, which means to follow the Ragatnika Bhakti, those bhaktas, those whose devotion is spontaneous by nature. So I'll read from what I've written, just a short piece about this. Srila Rupa Goswami was accepted as the leader of the six Goswamis and of all subsequent generations of Gauriyas, particularly because it was he who had revealed Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Manobhishta, his inner pining in the mood of Srimati Radharani for union with Krishna, that was the ultimate focus of Radhatmika Bhakti. Srila Sarsvara Thakur accepted that Srila Rupa Goswami as the Gauriya Abhideya Acharya, the teacher and authority in devotional praxis, had indeed outlined Raganuga Bhakti and that it was thus the highest sadhana of Rupanuga Bhakti. Yet Srila Bhaktisiddhan Saraswati maintained that generally before being gifted with Raganuga Bhakti, one had to be fixed in the elementary practices of Rupanuga Bhakti by adopting the sequential approach given by Srila Rupa Goswami that helped an aspirant develop initial taste for devotional service and thus invite the mercy by which attraction to Raganuga Bhakti could arise. In Srila Rupa Goswami's words, Ado Shadha Tata Sadhu Sangha Tabhajana Kriya Tato Nata Nibriti Syat Tato Nishtha Ruchis Tataha in the beginning there must be faith that devotional service to Krishna is the only genuine necessity of every living being. Such faith will impel one to associate with persons 
who are spiritually elevated. In the next stage, one becomes initiated by a genuine spiritual master, and under his instruction, the neophyte devotee begins the process of regulated devotional service. By execution of devotional service under the guidance of the spiritual master, one comes to the, to the stage of anartha nivritti, cessation of all mundane attachment and contamination. Then comes nishta, constant engagement in devotional service by mind, body, and words, which leads to ruchi, conscious desire for devotional service based on deliberation. This taste leads one further to asakti, the heart's desire to serve Krishna. which prepares the heart for the appearance of bhav, the preliminary platform of transcendental love of Godhead. Gradually, emotions intensify, and finally there is an awaking of pure love, prema. This is the progressive path by which prema, love of Godhead, manifests for the sadhaka in Krishna consciousness. So this is the path of rupa Noga bhakti as Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasvara Thakur very strongly outlined that they have to go in the right order and not that Rati Age Shadha Pache Rupa Noga Bolena those are in this uh, Prakrita Rasa Shata Dushan in which he was in which Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasvara Thakur was mm, smashing the misconceptions of the Prakrita Sahajiyas he again and again used the word Rupa Noga, a genuine follower of Rupa Goswami, and gave the, the, the proper idea, for instance, uh, that one develops rati or attachment in devotional service and faith afterwards. Rupa Noga Bale, they don't say like that. And that it's, this, it's a sequential process which Rupa Goswami has given. Prado Bhavet, Bhavet Kramaha, these symptoms develop in order. So it's not that you can just take a pole vault into Radha Kona and all of a sudden you just become a gopi. It doesn't work. It only, let's say, only imagination. Here are some more words from Srila Bhaktisthana Saraswati Thakur, the Prabhupada quoted, on how to become a Rupa Noga devotee. It is certainly, this is from Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhulila, chapter 19, text 133, Prabhupada. Prabhupada writes, it is certainly not good to write literature for money or reputation, but to write books and publish them for the enlightenment of the general populace is real service to the Lord. That was Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati's opinion. And he specifically told his disciples to write books. He actually preferred to publish books rather than establish temples. Temple construction is meant for the general populace and neophyte devotees, but the business of advanced and empowered devotees is to write books, publish them, and distribute them widely. According to Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, distributing literature is like playing on a great medanga. Consequently, we always request members of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness to publish as many books as possible and distribute them widely throughout the world. By thus following in the footsteps of Srila Rupa Goswami, one can become a Rupa Noga devotee. So this is a very big topic. A few years ago I was in Moscow and around this time of year, just before Balaram's appearance day, and Radhath Maharaj was there also and he spoke for several days on Rupa Goswami. <laughs> so I won't attempt to emulate that now. <laughs> but I will uh, summarize something which I already spoke on Goridas Pandit, who um, was one of the followers of Nityananda Prabhu. Yesterday I was saying how the followers of Nityananda Prabhu they are they are followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, in Sakuras. He was one of the, uh, Goyas Pandit was one of the Dwadash Gopal, the twelve principal cowherd boys who are followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, and in Krishna Lila, he was Subal, 
who happens to be the brother of Radharani. That's right. Hmm? Is it? Yeah. Mm. So, Goridas Pandit, uh, Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami says that he is highly empowered both to give and receive pure love of Krishna. Krishna praying, Dite Nite Dhare Mahashakti. He offered his home, his family, his everything to the lotus feet of Lord Nityananda and made Lord Nityananda and Lord Chaitanya the lords of his life. Uh, his Sripat, or the, the place where he performed his worship, where he lived, uh, is at Kalna, just south of Navadi, uh, on the, it's on the opposite Shantipur, the place of Advaita Acharya. Now there, Gauridas Pandit worshipped the first ever deities manifested in this appearance of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in this world. The first deities of Gornitai were worshipped by Gauridas, Gauridas Pandit and how he came to uh, worship them is as follows that Chaitanya uh, Mahaprabhu and Nityananda they regularly used to visit uh, Gauridas and they like to go and Goridas would cook them so many nice preparations and they'd have wonderful pastimes of Sankirtan. Um, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there came a point where he was going to take sannyas. So he wanted to visit Goridas one more time because he knew I'll be leaving Bengal. I won't I won't be have the opportunity again. So he went to visit Goridas with Nityananda. He would visit Advaita Acharya and then go to see Goridas on the other side of the Ganga. At the house of Goridas still there's an oar. You know this oar? For rowing a boat. Got the word? Yeah. An oar for rowing. So there's an oar which, and, and it's said that um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu he took a boat from Shantipur to Kalna at one time. And when he reached the other side, he gave the oar to Goridas and said, you can use this to take the conditioned souls to the other side of the river of material existence. There's also there a, a Bhagavad Gita, um, which is said to have been written by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because in those days books were written by hand. So um, Chaitanya Mahabhu came and he held a Sankirtan festival in the house of Goridas, but Goridas wasn't feeling very happy because he had a premonition or a, a feeling of something bad about to happen that Chaitanya Mahabhu is going to leave and, and I won't see him again. So. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nitai were chanting and dancing and Goridas fell down at the lotus feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and said, I have one request that now you've come to my home, just stay. Don't ever go anywhere else. If you go away from here, I will simply die. It's a very heavy request, isn't it? I can't live without you. Uh, you just stay here, I'll look after you very nicely, and you can deliver all the living entities in the universe just by staying here. <laughs> so, and he said, uh, he said, if you just stay here with me, then I'll understand that you're really worthy of the name Patita Pavan, the deliverer of the fallen. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told Goridas, just forget this idea. You can worship me in the form of the deity. I'll stay here as the deity and you serve me in that way. And saying this, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu manifested deities of himself and Nitai. But Goridas said, I don't want the deity, I want you. <laughs> so Mahaprabhu told Goridas, okay, you can either keep myself and Nitai, or you can keep the deities, whichever one you like, which one do you want? So he's looking at the deities, looking at, and he couldn't say which one was which. 
<laughs> because the deities are gone eternal. So, in this way, he understood that the deity is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, so, he let Chaitanya Mahaprabhu go while also keeping him in his home. And he started to serve Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda very nicely, dressing them, offering them flowers and fruitstuffs, putting sandalwood paste on their bodies. Um, he didn't think of them as deities. He just, because he saw they're gone time, so he just treated them that gone a time, come and stayed in my home. So he was always talking them to them, chattering with them. One day, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu started joking with him and said, Hey, Goridas, don't you remember? You used to be Subal. You forgot all the times you used to play on the bank of the Yamuna. Then Gornitai took the form of Krishna and Balaram, dressed as cowherd boys with buffalo horns and stick and flutes, peacock feather, forest flowers, angle bells tinkling. So Goridas, he also forgot that he was Goridas and became completely in the mood of Subal. And this went on for some time until his meditation broke and he saw and back to the Ingrami time. Every day Goridas used to cook a big feast. So many different preparations. So uh, he was doing this every day. But after some time Goridas was getting old, you know, he's a fully spiritual personality, they go through the pastimes of apparently becoming old. So even though it was becoming difficult for him, he went out every day cooking a huge <laughs> feast. With so many different, pre different preparations for going to town. So one day, while Goridas was in the kitchen cooking, Gornitai came into the, the, the kitchen and started chastising him. He said, why are you taking so much trouble? Why are you putting yourself... We're, we're not going to eat anything today. Then Goridas became angry at them and said, well, if you think you're going to be happy, happy by not eating, then why didn't you tell me before I started cooking? I wouldn't have cooked anything. Then he just became quiet in anger. Then he just, then he said, all right, I'll just cook a few preparations for you. Anyway, at least you today, you take full prasada. And anyway, don't try to stop me from cooking so many preparations. Whatever I can easily cook, I'll cook. And you just accept it. So, one time Gorinas was thinking, he was thinking, it would be so nice if Gornitai, if they could be decorated with so many different nice ornaments and jewels. And, and uh, he, was, he was meditating how, how nice that would be. And then he came before Gornitai and saw that just to please him, he, they had ma manifested the ankle bells and armlets and nose rings and so many wonderful ornaments just to please him. Um, Gornitai had many disciples, among whom Chaitanya Das was helping, he was his most prominent disciple. He used to help him in the deity worship and overseeing the affairs of the temple because by worshipping the deity so many people would come and have festivals there. And he was his uh, right-hand man, you could say, in organizing all these things. Now, just shortly before Gorponima, they would have a big festival on Gorponima. It's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's birthday. So Goridas went away from Kalna to another disciple's home. Um, and he gave charge of all activities and deity worship and everything to Chaitanya Das. So uh, Chaitanya Das was seeing that Gopanima is coming closer and closer and there's, there's no arrangements for any festival. And so with three days to go and no arrangements for any festival, he started organizing it. He sent out invitations to all the uh, eminent Vaishnavas of the area, that you please come and attend the festival. So, uh, just he sent out the invitations in his own name. So, just when he finished uh, penning all the letters and sending out devotees to deliver them, because there was no postal service in those days, Goridas came back, and Chaitanya Das told him that I've organized the festival and sent out invitations because. You hadn't come, so I thought it was my duty to do this. So Goridas was inwardly is very pleased that his disciple had taken this responsibility. But uh, outwardly he became angry that why are you acting so independently, sending invitations here and there? Uh, so he he banished him. He said, you, get, you don't stay here now. You want to be independent? Be independent. You just go away 
you can go on to the Ganga, the Ganga is close by, at least it is nowadays to that temple, and you just stay there. So he was staying there, and what happened? One wealthy man uh, came by and seeing the seeing this sadhu Chaitanya Das sitting under a tree on the bank of the Ganga, he wanted to offer a large donation. So uh, Chaitanya Das accepted the donation, and as a faithful disciple, can sent it to Gauri Das. But Gauri Das sent it back to him and said, "You invited so many people to make a festival, so you." He's still angry with him. You take the money and you make a festival. Do whatever you like. Don't send your money to me. So that's what he did. He made a. He organized a big festival there, and uh, so many devotees came. And they were having ecstatic kirtan. But Gauri Das was sitting at a little distance. And, but the kirtan was so ecstatic that Gauri Tai couldn't resist, so they jumped out and joined the kirtan also. So and uh, yeah, so. One of the devotees came to Goridas and said, said, uh, Guru Maharaj, come and see. Gornitai have left the temple. So he came and so oh, He's right. They left the temple. So he went, he went with a stick to come and chase them back. And he guessed they must have gone to see Chaitanya. These are pastimes. <laughs> you don't chase Gornitai. Um, uh, so he came to to the bank of the Ganga and saw Chaitanya Das having his festival. And when when Gornitai saw angry Gauri Das with a stick, they uh, vanished. They jumped inside Chaitanya Das's heart and Gauri Das could see where they had gone. So then he embraced Chaitanya Das and said that you are uh, so very fortunate that you have captured Chaitanya Mahabharu in your heart. So from now on, your name should be Hridaya Chaitanya because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is in your heart. And then they also went back to the temple, became good boys again. <laughs> Hare Krishna.